نحمد و نسلی و نسلیم علیہ رسول الکریم اما بعد فعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و ما ادراک من عقبہ فک رقبہ او اطعام فی یوم زی مسغبہ یتیما زا مقربہ او مسکینا زا متربہ بارک اللہ لی و لکم فی القرآن العظیم و نفعنی و ایاکم بالآیات و ذکر حکیم استغفر اللہ لی و لکم و لسائر المؤمنین و استغفروہ انہو هو الغفور الرحیم سبحانک لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انکا انت العلیم الحکیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احل العقدة من لسانی افقه قولی و بیسر و لا تعسر و تمن بالخیر و بکن استعین یا فتاح یا فتاح یا فتاح صدق اللہ العظیم و صدق رسوله النبی الكریم الامین السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ My dear brothers and sisters in Islam roughly 20 years ago before our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam began preaching his message as a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an incident happened in Makkah that was to forever shape the future of Arabian society and this was an incident in which our Prophet ﷺ participated and the wahi, the revelation, had not yet begun. And our Prophet ﷺ was barely 20 years old. What actually happened was, there was a poor trader, there was a poor businessman from one of the tribes of the Yemen. And the tribes of the Yemen were not considered to be as elite, as noble, as the tribes of the Quraysh. So this poor businessman, he came to Mecca from one of the tribes of Yemen. He came to Mecca before Hajj and he sold a good amount of merchandise to one of the richest noblemen of Quraysh by the name of Al-As ibn Wail. And Al-As ibn Wail said to him that come to me after Hajj and I will pay you your money. So that man said, okay, fine. He came back after Hajj, he went to Al-As ibn Wail, and he said, can I have my money back now? Because you owe me such a large amount of money. And Al-As ibn Wail said, you know what, I don't have my money now, come back to me tomorrow. So he came again tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. And it was pretty clear that Al-As ibn Wail was pro procrast procrastinating, never intending to pay this man any money because he was one of a rich nobleman, he was of a Qurayshi, and who is this man to get his money from him? I know, which, which place would he go to? Which court could he go to? Which higher authority could he go to when Al-As ibn Wail was one of the chieftains of the Quraysh? So this poor man, this poor businessman, he went to many of the elders of the Quraysh, knocking on their doors, pleading them, Please help me out, do something. Al-As ibn Wail owe me so much money, so please help me out. And every single elder of the Quraysh made an excuse that Al-As ibn Wail is too powerful, he's too rich, I do not want to get involved, please go and ask somebody else. At last, finally, in desperation, this person resorted to writing a satirical poem, a very, very harsh poem, criticizing the Quraysh. And he stood up in front of the Kaaba. This was their propaganda. This was their BBC. This was their means of getting news across. So he stood up in front of the Kaaba and he gave a scathing critique of the Quraysh. And he said, of what use is it to come from descent of Quraysh, of what use is it to claim to live closer to the Kaaba when a poor person like myself in Ihram can be cheated, can be stolen money from in broad daylight and none of you moves a finger to do anything about it. Blessedness, he said, blessedness does not come from living next to the Kaaba. Blessedness, blessedness comes from your manners and mannerism. A kafir, a mushrik, speaking the truth as if there is no tomorrow. Telling them clearly that it doesn't matter what your lineage is. We don't care 
where you are descended from. We do not care where you live. If you are not honest, if you are not trustworthy, if you are not upright, we do not care. You are not worth anything. And this poem spread across Arabia like a wildfire. And the elders of the Quraysh decided that they need to act. And the first person to act was the uncle of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, the eldest uncle of Prophet wasallam, Az Zubayr bin Abdul Muttalib. And Az Zubayr, Az Zubayr gathered all the elders of the Quraysh, and there was only one person who was from the youngsters. And it was our Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Everybody else was from the elders, except for our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and together they formed for the very first time in the history of Arabia together they formed a pact, a treaty and this is the treaty that we all know as Hilf al-Fudul Hilf al-Fudul, it is also called Hilf al mutayyibin and Hilf al-Fudul, Hilf al mutayyibin had it scored that no matter who is shown injustice to, we as the Quraysh will always be on the side of the oppressed. We as the Quraysh will always be on the side of the one who was wronged. Even if the one who wronged him is our brother, our uncle, our elder, we do not care. We will always side the oppressed. Our Prophet ﷺ participated in this treaty. He was one of the youngsters. As a matter of fact, he was the only youngster who participated in that treaty. And that treaty became the most honorable treaty in the history of Arabia before the coming of Islam. Our Prophet ﷺ, when he finally migrated to Medina many, many years after this incident, 40 years after this incident, our Prophet ﷺ said that I witnessed this treaty in the house of Ibn Jad'an. This treaty meaning Hilf al-Fadul. I witnessed that treaty in the house of Ibn Jad'an. And if I were to ask to uphold this treaty, even in Islam, I would do so. I would obey this treaty even now, and I would not give up my place in that room for many red camels. In our English language, for a million pounds, I would not give up my place for being in that room. So this is the treaty of Hilf al-Fadul. Now you may be wondering, what is the benefit of this treaty? Why did I start my lecture today with this treaty when last week I promised all of you I will talk about the ways in which we can challenge Islamophobia. Because we talked about Islamophobia last week. Now what are the ways in which we can challenge, we can battle Islamophobia? So why do I start today's khutbah with this treaty? Because my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this treaty truly demonstrates for all of us the true spirit of Islam. The reality of what it means to be a Muslim. Because our Prophet وسلم, before the revelation began, before he began preaching, La ilaha illallah, our Prophet وسلم, was standing up for truth, for justice. He was standing up against trinical powers, against zulm, against oppression, against evil. It was only after the age of 40 that our Prophet ﷺ began preaching a different theological message that was different than the message of those who came before him ﷺ. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, for many of us, in our times for many of us, and please forgive me for saying that, and let me be blunt here, many of us, we put the cart before the horse. We think da'wah is only about talking. We think da'wah is only about knocking on doors and distributing your pamphlets or giving the copies of the Qur'an. We think that da'wah is only about debates and arguments and lectures and conventions and conferences. And please don't take me wrong, I'm not trying to dismiss that element of da'wah. That is important. We need to call people towards tawheed. That is the essence of da'wah. We need to talk, we need to teach, we need to preach, we need to engage in dialogue and debate. We need to hold these conferences and conventions. All of that is beautiful. But what I'm trying to stress here today is the reality that many Muslims, including myself, either they ignore it or they choose to ignore it. And what is that reality? Before our Prophet ﷺ began knocking on doors, before our Prophet ﷺ began distributing his versions of pamphlets, 
Before our Prophet began teaching a new religion, a new theological message, our Prophet had already established his credential as somebody who cared for the society, who was involved with the people, who stood up, who did his best, who strove his best to correct the evils and the wrongs of society. Even before the first revelation began, what was the first revelation? Come on. What was the first revelation? We're sitting in the mosque that is known by the name of that revelation. Iqra, right? Iqra was the first revelation. Even the first revelation came down. We all know the story. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ran to Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, please cover me, please cover me. And he said to Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha, Ya Khatija, I think I'm losing my mind. I'm seeing images. I'm hearing voices. I think I'm losing my mind. And what did Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha say to him? Even before she heard Iqra, even before Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her that Jibreel came to me and he told me this, even before all of that, what did Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha say to her husband? She said, Wallahi la yukhzikallahu abada. I take Allah's qasam, Allah will never ever humiliate you by causing you to go mad. Allah will never ever humiliate you. Why? What's the reason behind it? Number one, inna ka latasiru raham. You are good to your relatives. Number two, you take care of the orphans. Number three, you feed the poor. Number four, if there is any need in society, you are the first one to volunteer and do it. You do all of these things, Ya Rasulullah. You do all of these things. How could Allah humiliate you by causing you to lose your mind? How could Allah humiliate you by causing you to, mis to be misguided? My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, please notice here, she can say the character of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she is the wife. She is the wife. Nobody knows you better than the people of your household. You can be the best version of yourself outside of your house and you can, you can be the monster inside the house. There is a reason why Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Khayrukum Khayrukum Ali. The best amongst you is not somebody who comes to the masjid, pray his salah five times a day, grows a long beard, read a beautiful Quran. No, the best amongst you is the one who is best to his house, who is best to his family. Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha is the wife. All of you Desi husbands can understand that, can appreciate the fact that when she says that he has that character, then our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had that character. And she can see the character of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even before Iqra was revealed. Even before Iqra was revealed. And what is the character of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He has already established a reputation for standing up for the causes that afflict society, for the social injustices, for the oppression, for the zulm. He is already a figure that nobody can accuse of being neutral or being selfish. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, one way to phrase this, and this is a very simple phrase, and I hope you take this phrase away with you back to home. One way to phrase this, our Prophet wasallam was known as Al-Ameen before he was called Al-Rasul on this earth. Our Prophet وسلم, was known as Al Amin before he was called Ar Rasul on this earth. Yeah. And the reason is obvious, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Before you begin preaching, you need to have credibility. You need to have proper credentials. You cannot just open your mouth and people don't even know who you are. You can't just start telling them of a new religion, of a new theology, and nobody has ever seen you except to preach this theology. Our Prophet وسلم, when he began preaching, even his worst enemies had to admit that he's good to his relatives. He feed the poor. He take care of the orphans. Shahid al-anamu bi fadlihi hatta al-adha. Beautiful poetry. Shahid al-anamu bi fadlihi hatta al-adha. The entire humanity had to accept the beauty of the character of our Prophet ﷺ. Even his worst enemies had to say that nobody has the most upright character in our society other than this person. And then the Shahir says, well, فضل بما شهد العنا, The true beauty of your character is something that even your worst enemies had to admit. Even your worst enemies have to accept and acknowledge that is the beauty of your true character. Yeah. Abu Sufyan, he later became a Muslim. But when this story is taking place, he's not a Muslim. 
and he's interviewed by the emperor of Rome, Hiraqal. A very famous hadith mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, a very famous hadith. He's interviewed by the emperor of Hiraqal, and Abu Sufyan is trying his best to dismiss Prophet ﷺ, to dismiss the message of Prophet ﷺ. But then he's asked by the emperor of Rome, what does your prophet tell you to do? What does that person tell you to do? And Abu Sufyan now cannot lie because he has his companions around him. He says in the hadith, out of the fear of being called a liar, I didn't lie at that point. Those people had that integrity, we don't. Even the kafirs of those days had that integrity. So now he cannot lie. So what does he say? Abu Sufyan says that this person tells us to only worship one God and leave the gods of our forefathers. And he tells us to be nice to your relatives. And yet he tells us to feed the poor. And he tells us to take care of the orphans. Look at the message. Look at the message. That even a pagan, a kafir, had to say this in front of the emperor of Rome. What was the impression? What was the message? What was the PR of early Muslims? Look at the stereotype that exists for early Muslims. Oh, these Muslims, they take care of the orphans. Or they take care of the poor. This was the stereotype that existed for the early Muslims. And in our times, you ask anybody, what do they think of Muslims? Ask anybody. And I'm sorry to say this, you already know the answer. You already know the answer. I'm guilty of that and you all are guilty of that. The reason is, my dear brothers, we have failed miserably to live up to the sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ, to be known as Al-Ameen before we start preaching what is our risala. To be called the people who care about the causes of this world, who speak out against oppression, against zulm. We are not known for any of this, for not any of this. Please forgive me for saying this, but where is the credibility that we have established with the people around us? Where is that credibility? It is as if we read the early Makkan Surah and we read them with our beautiful voices, with the beautiful Tajweed and Qira'ah, and every Makhraj is a point. And we read these beautiful verses of the Qur'an, the early verses or earliest revelation of the Qur'an, and we ignore, it is as if we ignore what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us in those verses. The earliest revelations encourage Muslims to be generous. One of the first surahs to be revealed. What do you know is the most difficult thing for you, do, for you to do? What is the most difficult thing for you to do? Fakku raqaba, go and free slaves. Aw ita'amun fi yawmin dhi maskhaba, yatiman za maqraba, aw miskinan za matraba. Go and feed people even when you yourself are hungry. You do not have enough, still you give your food to somebody else. The earliest revelations of the Qur'an, wa yut'imun at-ta'ama ala hubbi. These people, the believers, they give their food even though they love it, even though they need it, they give their food. Miskina wa yatima wa asira to the miskin, to the fakir, to the prisoners of war. By the way, my dear brothers, let me take a pause here. The time when this ayah was revealed, there were no Muslim prisoners of war, right or wrong? There was no war going on for the Muslims such that there are prisoners of war for the Muslims. Right? The only prisoners of war were idol worshippers, were pagans, were kafir, were mushrik. But when it comes to hunger, when it comes to oppression, when it comes to zulm, our religion is crystal clear. We do not care about your color and creed. We do not care about your race and religion. Wallahi, we do not care whether you are a kafir or a Muslim. If you are all hungry, we have been told that we need to feed you. We need to give you our food. لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا And we don't even want your tank. إنما نطعمكم لوجه الله We are doing this. We give you our food only and solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear Muslims of Scotland, tell me where this early Makkan is implemented in Scotland. Show me and I will show you where our da'wah is going to be successful. Show me. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, our religion is an action-based religion. Our religion is a religion in which you have to match your speech with your actions. Ilm and amal. Knowledge and good deeds go hand in hand. Always go hand in hand. 
But unfortunately, my dear brothers, and like I said, I am guilty of that as well. I am guilty of that as well. For many of us, da'wah becomes talking and preaching. Da'wah becomes conventions and conferences. Da'wah becomes distributing and knocking on doors. That's just one part of the da'wah. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to dismiss that. It is important. But it's only one aspect of the da'wah, and that is the talk. That is the aim. We need the talk, but we need the action, my dear brothers. We need the actions. We need to show who we are. We need to, we need to have a respectability. We need to be known as those who are championing the causes of this world. You know Islamophobia, and that is the topic that I have today. How to battle Islamophobia. Islamophobia can primarily be silenced. We can silence our critics, not just by the talk, but through our actions, through championing the social injustices that one rampant in our society, through preaching people what our religion told us to preach, through standing up, standing against, and voicing against oppression and zulm that our religion tells us as oppression. Let me give you a simple example. How many of you remember Occupy London Movement? Does anybody remember Occupy London Movement? It happened almost a decade ago. I was a student here, I just came to the UK, I was doing my PhD. And Occupy London Movement, it was a protest that started in solidarity with Occupy Wall Street Movement. I think you guys remember that. It was, it was a good, it was a big movement. And as a student, it was so shocking for me to see the kind of anger that this nation had for the style of capitalism that is being used and executed and demonstrated by the rich bankers. You know, look at the Occupy London movement. Look at the Occupy Wall Street movement. Look at the We Are the 99 Person movement. Who could have predicted amongst us that this nation would hate and despise the very system that they used to claim was the reason for their success. That system has been demolished and destroyed. Now the 99% of the globe says, occupy London. 99% of the globe says, occupy Wall Street. Because they don't like the fact that the rich only get richer. That the top 1% of this world owns more than 35% of this world. This is an unreal statistic. This is a pharaonic society where we want to enjoy pyramids, but we do not realize in order to build those pyramids, you have to enslave millions of people. This is what this society has become. My question to all of my brothers here. Many of us remember that movement. My question to all of us. Where were we at the head of that movement? Where were we at the head of London Occupy movement? Simply to tell them that my fellow citizens, our Rabb, our Lord has told us that this system is not a good system, that this system will collapse. Our Lord told us that the economic system cannot be, and I quote from the Quran, yakuna This is the strongest words criticizing the capitalist system that exists in this country and many other Western lands. In five words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demolishes and destroys that version of capitalism. Money should not be a playful thing amongst the rich, so that rich only get richer. Allah does not want the rich to get richer. Allah wants the rich to give their money down to the poor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to minimize this economic disparity that we are currently seeing in our country. If only we had been at the head of that movement, if only we had been telling people, our Lord has told us that this economic system is unfair system, it's not going to be sustainable, that we need to make sure that wealth goes through, permeate through the entire society. The wealth is not meant to generate more wealth, it is meant to take care of our society. If only we had been at the head of that movement, what would have, hap what would have happened? You know, people would have said, you know what, you guys are right. You people were right. 
maybe we should have listened to you. And then we could have said, okay, you didn't listen to us that time, maybe now we can tell you that you can listen to. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. If we had been at the forefront of environmentalism, I think the most amount of plastic we use in our masajid during the month of Ramadan. And we don't care. Nobody cares. If we had been at the forefront of environmentalism, if we had been at the forefront of animal rights, this is all part of our religion, my dear brothers. If we had been teaching the people the reality of what our religion teaches us to do, this is not just for the PR, PR comes along. But the reality is a Muslim is someone who does this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should not be doing that for the sake of PR. We should not be wanting to change and challenge social injustices because it's going to benefit our da'wah, no. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, challenging social injustices is the essence of our da'wah. And until we understand this, we are going to struggle, we are going to continue to struggle. And we are going to continue to struggle to call people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to represent Islam in the best way possible. Why? Because da'wah is much more than your talk, da'wah is much more than my talk. Da'wah is primarily actions. And I will conclude on this story, my dear brothers. I know a lot of youngsters are sitting here sometime when we talk about the stories that took place in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they couldn't relate to it. So I have this example that I want to share with you and I will conclude with that insha'Allah. How many of you have heard about Dr. Hawa Abdi? Nobody? Anybody? Inshallah, after today everybody will know about Dr. Hawa Abdi. Dr. Hawa Abdi is from Mogadishu in Somalia and 35 years ago, she opened up a clinic for women. She was one of those very few women, women who managed to get actual education, became a gynecologist, studied abroad, then came back in Mogadishu, and she opened up a clinic. And then the country was engulfed in civil war, and it has been involved ever since in civil wars, in warlords, in Islamic, uh, Islamic extremists, all of these shebangs. Everything is a complete mess. But what did Dr. Hawa Abdi do? Did she, did she sit back and start criticizing everyone? Did she become an armchair critic? What did she do? She opened up a clinic and made it free for everyone. And during the civil war, two tribes began killing one another for no reason other than nationalism. And she took in both sides of the conflict, both from this tribe, both from that tribe. She didn't care which tribe you belong to. You come to my clinic, I will treat you. And on more than one occasion, she was threatened by the members of one tribe to not treat the other tribe. At one point in time, the whole tribe, one of the tribe, marched up to the clinic and at gunpoint demanded that she handed over the members of the other tribe so that they can massacre them right there and then. And she, she did not have any army, she did not have BBC, she did not have CNN, she didn't have any of those media. She was just a woman who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She stood up her ground and she said, if you want to kill them, you have to go through me. For more than 35 years, she had treated tens of thousands of people, and I'm positive when she started, she didn't know that the whole world would be watching. I'm really disappointed, to be honest, that nobody knows about her here. I'm really disappointed. And I'm sorry that I'm saying that. But she treated tens of thousands of people for 35 years, and slowly but surely, the news trickles out. And the West have found out about it. And the news agencies have found out, have found out what a beautiful story. And then she was nominated, she was given an award, she won the National Woman of the Year award by multiple organizations. Glamour magazine nominated her as the Woman of the Year. When was the last time Glamour magazine nominated a muhajiba for anything? TED Talk invited her to give a speech. TED Talk is one of the most prestigious speaking institutions. And she gave a speech at TED Talk, wearing hijab, a jalabaya, covered everything. When was the last time TED Talk invited a muhajiba? Dr. Hawa Abdi really showed us, you want to fight Islamophobia? That's how you fight Islamophobia. She passed away last year. And when I heard of her story, I said to myself, I cannot stand here and talk about fighting Islamophobia without honoring this woman. She showed us that if you really want to fight Islamophobia, if you really want to change the mind and hearts of the people who are around you, then there are far more effective ways to do that than just opening your mouth and talking. You can do that by showing through your actions what you are really made of. And that's what we need to do. 
So I sincerely make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who walk the walk and not just talk the talk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya and may Allah reunite us in the hereafter. Wa akhru da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Brothers are requested to perform their sunnah.